When Booster 18 exploded, everyone expected SpaceX to slow down. Instead, they just completed Booster 19 in 28 days, compared to 175 days for Booster 18. That's over six times faster than before. What did SpaceX discover in that explosion that actually made them faster? Ship 39 has been fully stacked for over a month, waiting for critical validation data. Test Tank 18 just finished proving out Block 3 structural upgrades at Massey's. So what exactly are these upgrades hiding, and why did SpaceX need a dedicated test article first? Let's dive right in. The answer lies in what SpaceX learned from failure and how they turned that knowledge into their fastest production cycle ever. After Booster 18's explosion, most aerospace companies would pause, review, reassess. SpaceX did the opposite. The methane tank final ring entered Mega Bay 1 on December 20th. The oxygen tank section had already been waiting for two weeks. Within days, both sections were mated and Booster 19 stood complete. This wasn't just fast. This was a fundamental shift in how SpaceX approaches catastrophic failure. Here's what makes this remarkable. Traditional aerospace operates on a simple principle. When something explodes, you stop everything until you understand why. SpaceX operates differently. They identified the root cause, a COPV failure in the Chine region, and immediately implemented design changes while production continued. Notice those red COPVs visible in Booster 19's imagery? Same location where Booster 18 failed. Different design. That's the critical detail everyone's missing. This is modular production at its most aggressive. While investigators analyzed Booster 18's wreckage, fabrication teams were already building improved components for Booster 19. No waiting for final reports, no committee approvals, just rapid iteration based on real-time failure data. It's how SpaceX maintains launch cadence even after major setbacks, a capability that becomes essential when you're planning multiple Starship flights per month. But speed means nothing without validation. And that's where Ship 39's story gets interesting. Ship 39 has been fully stacked for over a month. Engines ready, hardware complete, yet it hasn't moved to the test stand. Why? because SpaceX refuses to gamble with a billion-dollar flight article when they can validate first with dedicated test hardware. Enter Test Tank 18, the unsung hero of Block 3 development. This wasn't a flight vehicle. It was purpose-built to fail. SpaceX loaded it with cryogenics, stressed it to design limits, pushed it beyond rated loads, all to find where Block 3 structural upgrades might break before Ship 39 ever left the production site. Think about that strategy. They built an entire test article just to destroy it safely on the ground, rather than risk discovering problems during Ship 39's static fire or, worse, during flight. Last week, Test Tank 18 completed its torture testing and returned from Massey's with the data SpaceX needed. Strain response under extreme loads, reinforcement effectiveness at critical joints, failure margins for new structural elements. That information is now driving final adjustments on Ship 39. This is engineering discipline at the highest level. No shortcuts. No assumptions. Prove it on the ground before you prove it in flight. The ship cryogenic test stand arriving from Massey's tells another part of this story. It's being upgraded with Block 3-style hold-down clamps, hardware specifically designed to handle the new structural loads and mounting points that Block 3 introduces. These aren't minor tweaks. Block 3 represents significant changes to Starship's structural architecture, and every piece of ground support equipment needs upgrading to match. What exactly are these Block 3 upgrades? SpaceX hasn't published detailed specs, but the clues are everywhere. Dedicated test articles, upgraded holddowns, reinforced load paths. This points to fundamental changes in how Starship's structure distributes forces during propellant loading, engine firing, and atmospheric flight. The kind of changes you only make when you're pushing performance beyond what Block 2 could handle. If current progress holds, Ship 39 rolls to Massey's for cryo-proof within weeks, followed by engine installation and static fire. Flight 12 remains on track for Q1 2025. That timeline depends entirely on Ship 39 passing its upcoming tests, tests that will validate everything Test Tank 18 died proving. Now let's talk about Pad 2 because this is where SpaceX's orbital ambitions become real infrastructure. 
The orbital launch mount is essentially complete. Scaffolding coming down signals the final phase. Systems integration and checkout. But one detail reveals how carefully SpaceX thinks about reusability. Those protective access doors for the 20 booster hold down clamp arms? Only one installed so far, likely for fit and clearance verification. These doors close immediately after liftoff to shield internal mechanisms from plume debris and thermal loads. Get the design wrong and you're replacing damaged clamps after every launch. Get it right and the same hardware services hundreds of flights. The hydraulic actuator upgrade tells a more urgent story. Two actuators removed, replaced with larger, higher capacity units. This wasn't planned obsolescence. This was a direct response to limitations discovered during testing. Insufficient force margin, inadequate response speed, or poor dynamic damping under real loads. Initial slow motion functional checks completed. Faster full range tests coming soon. SpaceX doesn't publish what went wrong with the original actuators, but the upgrade's timing suggests they found a weakness before it became a failure. The ship quick disconnect arm integration marks another critical milestone. Structurally installed, connected to fluid, power, and control lines. The QD interface at Sanchez, responsible for delivering propellants, pressure gases, and electrical power to the upper stage, was mated with the arm extension this week. Soon that entire assembly integrates with the SQD arm at Pad 2. Why does this matter? Because Pad 2 becomes operational in January with Booster 19's static fire serving as the first full system test of both vehicle and infrastructure. Not just the rocket, everything. Launch mount, tower arms, QD systems, hold down clamps. This is SpaceX's validation philosophy again. Test the complete integrated system before flight, not individual components in isolation. Meanwhile, Pad 1 is being systematically erased. Launch mount legs removed. Water-cooled steel plates gone. Crews excavating soil to expose foundation piles for removal, making way for a Pad 2-style flame trench. The water deluge system, all three large storage tanks already removed, four smaller tanks scheduled next, is being dismantled piece by piece. High-pressure nitrogen vessels and delivery piping following the same path. This isn't just demolition. This is SpaceX acknowledging that Pad 1's architecture couldn't scale to high-cadence operations. The water deluge system, for all its spectacular launch day visuals, couldn't protect the pad structure from repeated Starship launches. Pad 2's flame trench design solves that problem with passive geometry instead of active cooling systems. Fewer moving parts. Less maintenance. Higher reliability. But the most significant development this week happened at Massey's, and it's getting almost no attention. A new test jig is being assembled around the static fire test stand. Two side support structures holding a horizontal platform designed to represent the relative alignment of two docked Starship vehicles. Two quick disconnect ports mounted on this platform, positioned to interface directly with the docking and refueling adapter on ship's exterior. This is SpaceX preparing to validate orbital refueling architecture on the ground before attempting it in space. Why does this matter more than Booster 19's speed record? Because orbital refueling is the keystone capability that makes everything else possible. Moon missions, Mars missions, deep space exploration, none of it works without transferring cryogenic propellants between vehicles and microgravity. NASA's been studying this problem for decades. SpaceX is about to demonstrate it. The ground test jig lets engineers evaluate seal integrity under cryogenic conditions, mechanical alignment tolerances between docked vehicles, disconnect and reconnect sequencing, and propellant flow behavior when you're transferring hundreds of tons of liquid methane and oxygen. These aren't simple problems. Cryogenic seals that work perfectly on the ground can fail catastrophically in vacuum. Alignment tolerances measured in millimeters on Earth become critical factors when there's no gravity to settle propellants. This test jig represents months of design work and fabrication finally coming together, and its timing, appearing just as Flight 12 hardware approaches launch readiness, suggests SpaceX is moving toward actual orbital refueling demonstrations faster than most analysts predicted. The COPV testing bays at Massey's tell the final piece of this story, 
dedicated facilities for individual COPV proof, and burst testing at flight pressures. This is SpaceX's direct response to back-to-back -back COPV failures that destroyed Ship 36 and Booster 18. No more relying solely on supplier qualification data. Every COPV gets validated in-house before integration. This is rack-by-rack -rack validation, earlier identification of manufacturing defects, risk reduction before COPVs enter flight vehicles, the red COPVs on Ship 39 and Booster 19. Those likely went through this new screening process, design changes to mitigate the identified failure mechanism, plus individual testing to catch manufacturing defects the supplier might miss. Here's what SpaceX isn't saying publicly. COPV failures nearly derailed the entire Starship program. Two catastrophic losses in rapid succession from the same root cause? That's not bad luck. That's a systemic problem. The new testing infrastructure at Massey's represents SpaceX, acknowledging they can't trust supplier data alone. Not when COPV failures mean losing billion-dollar vehicles and months of schedule. Then the Wall Street Journal investigation dropped, and SpaceX had to confront a different kind of failure. Public perception. The WSJ report cited FAA documents suggesting Starship breakup events created temporary debris hazard zones over the Caribbean, with falling fragments persisting for nearly an hour, forcing air traffic controllers to reroute flights and manage elevated workload. The reporting questioned whether SpaceX's relationship with regulators contributed to leniency in handling these risks. SpaceX's response was uncharacteristically defensive. They stated hazard zones were conservatively defined in advance, aircraft actively rerouted in real time, no planes in danger. They called the report misleading based on incomplete information. Here's the analysis most coverage missed. Both sides are partly right. SpaceX does define hazard zones conservatively and reroute traffic proactively. But that doesn't change the fact that Starship testing creates real operational burdens for air traffic control and temporary restrictions on Caribbean airspace. As launch cadence increases, SpaceX's stated goal is multiple flights per month. These impacts multiply. This isn't about safety in the immediate sense. It's about sustainable operations at scale. Can SpaceX maintain high launch cadence while minimizing disruption to commercial aviation? The answer determines whether Starship becomes a practical transportation system or remains an experimental testbed with limited flight opportunities. So here's what just happened. SpaceX took their worst nightmare, a booster exploding on the pad, and turned it into their fastest production cycle ever. 28 days from catastrophic failure to full stack. That's not recovery. That's evolution under pressure. But the real story isn't just speed. It's what that speed reveals about how SpaceX operates. While Booster 19 was being stacked six times faster, they were simultaneously validating Block 3 upgrades through Test Tank 18, upgrading Pad 2 infrastructure, building orbital refueling test systems, and implementing comprehensive COPV screening. Most companies can't walk and chew gum. SpaceX is running five marathons simultaneously. January brings Booster 19 static fire at Pad 2, the first complete system test of next-generation launch infrastructure. Ship 39 rolls to Massey's for cryoproof, carrying Block 3 secrets that could redefine Starship's capabilities. And somewhere in that timeline, orbital refueling hardware starts proving itself on the ground before it proves itself in space. 28 days from explosion to full stack. That's the headline. But the real victory? SpaceX just demonstrated they can accelerate through failure instead of being stopped by it. And that changes everything about how fast we reach Mars. If you found this analysis valuable, hit that like button and share this video with anyone following Starship development. Drop a comment below. What surprised you most about Booster 19's timeline? And subscribe to Space Update 24 hours for the most detailed Starship coverage on YouTube. We'll see you in the next one.